one of my favorite sayings ever is to innovate, disrupt your routine. And sometimes we disrupt our own routines. Sometimes our routines are disrupted for us. And one of the things I think is really important about that is it makes you think different. And a lot of times when I'm having these conversations about education, and I kind of been referring to the last little while as the blur, right? Like, I don't know if it's been one year, two, whatever, but it just seems like a blur now, right? And one of the questions I pose all the time is, are we holding out to get back to education in 2019 or are we creating something new and better as we move forward? And the reason I bring this up is because of this great conversation I had with uh, Superintendent Chris Kennedy out of West Vancouver Schools. I've known Chris for a very long time. Him and I are very friendly. He's someone I really look up to and have, uh, he's had a lot of impact on my thinking. I read his blogs. We, to be honest with you, we don't always agree on stuff, which is one of the reasons I like him so much because we'll have these really great conversations kind of pushing each other's thinking because we try to disrupt each other's thinking. We, we want to push each other to become better because the whole reason we push each other to become better is because ultimately we know the big winner through that process is kids. So I, I really hope you love this, um, this podcast with Chris. We not only talk about education, we talk about, you know, trying to live a healthy lifestyle. We talk about, you know, being parents and, you know, the impact that it has, but he does some really unique things and some interesting things. And I think that both of us have evolved in our learning and you'll kind of see us talk about that process and why that's so important to kind of, you know, shift your thinking as you get, you know, as you learn more through this process that no matter where you are in education, um, there's always learning to be done. And hopefully you see that model in this podcast, but I know you're going to love it. This, this interview with Chris Kennedy, it's absolutely awesome. Uh, welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Crows with another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And I'm really blessed to have someone who I consider a good friend, even though we don't talk that much, but when we do talk, it's like very, you know, it's like we have it, we always talk, which is wonderful. Uh, I, I actually read your blog every time it comes out, goes right to my email. And I always text you after and give you a hard time, whatever you write, right? You do. I appreciate that. I, 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 as long as you're reading, that's good. I am reading it. Except for, except for, Maybe we'll get into the April 1st special, <laughs> special uh, blog. But hey, for those who, of you who don't know Chris, uh, he just finished his dissertation. Uh, he is technically a doctor, but he, he just he's pretty easy going, wants to be called Chris in the podcast. So I'm not going to give him a hard time with that, but very well accomplished. He's done amazing things. Uh, and, and the thing I'll say about you, Chris, is at a personal level, uh, I, I know that you have tremendous accomplishments as an educator. People know you. One of the things I really look up to you is like, I've always watched you as a dad, right? And as you know, uh, a dad with very young kids, uh, I've watched your kids grow up, play sports. And it, it's really cool to kind of see, cause I know how excited you are about that. And I actually, as someone who looks at a superintendent, I actually really love that you share that personal side, right? Cause I think a lot of times it's just like, oh, like the superintendent's evil, right? But then when you realize the superintendent is a dad and has kids, you're like, oh, well, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be that bad a guy, <laughs> be that bad. Right. So, um, I, I just love that personal aspect. And I think that, you know, um, it's really meaningful and I love that you, I don't know how you do it, but I know that you find that balance because you, you know, we talked about our, our own health. I know you're focused on that. You seem like you have like, you know, more hours in the day than everybody, just the way you balance things, which I really appreciate. But if you can just kind of tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do today and kind of how you got to that point. I know people would love to hear that. Yeah, thanks, George. So um, I'm 11, almost 12 years into being superintendent here. And so about 27 years into a career of, uh, you know, starting as a high school teacher, teaching uh, uh, math and science to start and coaching basketball. And, and then, um, you know, and then moving into I was a, a high school vice principal an elementary principal, high school principal, and then into district uh, into district level work. Um, and, and you're right, as I've been going through, I've always tried to keep that other piece in, in mind. I've, I, I've kept coaching every year, every year since the beginning. This is my 35th year coaching sport, uh, wow. coaching basketball um, of high school and youth basketball, whether sometimes I'm too busy in the winter and I just coach AAU stuff in the summer. And um, that's super important in my life. And uh, and then other, you're right. The other part is sort of that personal health is super important to me, too, and uh, is looking after, you know, I know you've been on a real journey with your health and so have i the last since covid last couple of years about about really prioritizing that as well and so 
trying to, you know, the, 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 the work, the important work we're doing around education and then that the, the, with around family and sport for me, and then that personal health are, are kind of what define me. So I'm going to, we're going to start with education, like obviously, but I actually do want to ask you about the health stuff. Right. So like, was there for you like a, a turning point or at some point there was like a click during COVID that you, cause I like, like I, like you've always been to me in, in pretty good shape, but I know you've taken it to an, another level and you've probably been more focused on that. Is there something that clicked? Is there a reasoning for that? Like, did something ha- like did something click on that? Like what, what happened there kind of really to take a, a hold of that, I guess, during pandemic? Yeah. It, you know, it's been super interesting to see how different people have responded around the pandemic. You know, for me, it was, I'm going to come out of this. I'm going to come out of this way better than I entered it. And I, you know, I don't know how long it's going to be. And like, I was like, I, I just got on a program and I started running every day. And I, I was, I was committed that I was going to like, I wasn't going to say, well, it's time to rest and recover. I was going to use it as a, like, it's time to differentiate yourself and, and you know, from other people. And so like, I, I didn't want to come out however long the pandemic was, whether it was two months or two years and, and then go, well, you know, I was just kind of waiting and seeing. Like, I was like, I wanted to attack during that. Like, this was a chance that, you know, I finished my doctorate during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. I just pounded through that as well, because like, let's, if I got a little more time now, let's, let's get after it. Yeah. And like, people are totally in different places. Right. And like, obviously some people, you know, dealing with trauma of some of the stuff in different ways. But I think that for me was like, I, it was partly like, Hey, here's an opportunity for me to, you know, reverse some damage that I may have done. And I think, yeah, I think you're kind of you kind of like, for me, I was like in a cycle that I didn't realize I was in. Do you know what I mean? And then I think when, when things kind of stopped and I kind of stepped back, I'm like, this is not good. I got to figure something out here. Right. George, probably you find it in your work. And I find mine is, is that you just take on more commitment sometimes and you can't Mm -hmm. get rid of the old ones. The pandemic allowed you to, to get a break and now you not to come back to some commitments that you not really wanted to carry on with like for years even, but you just did them. Yeah. Yeah. You just, there's, there's a, actually a quote that I love. It's uh, to innovate, disrupt your routine. And it was like, whether it sometimes that routine is not, is disrupted by something else. And I think that for me, I was like in a routine, it was not a good one. And it's, I think sometimes for me, I had to step back and take that too. So it, it's really cool uh, to see that. And I was actually all excited because now I was like, Hey, I'm finally in good enough shape to go running with Chris Kennedy. And now you're running ultra marathon. So, so there's that that's over now. So I guess that's, that's never going to happen. Right. We did go running in Niagara falls. I don't know if you remember we that. did. I remember that. Yeah. We were, we were about the same speed then no, we, we were, were both, we no, were we both a hundred pounds heavier than we are now. <laughs> no, no, you, you ran the same speed I did for me. It wasn't no, like okay. you, I set the pace that day and it was <laughs> slow. It was, and it wasn't like, uh, it was like, uh, you know, I'll help this guy out. So I, I appreciate that. Um, so I, I, I want to ask you about this. Um, and I know you've shared this before. You had a kind of a unique experience going into the superintendency, right? So like you, like I, from what I remember, you knew you're going to be the superintendent, but you actually kind of like were mentored for maybe that's not the best term, but you knew while someone was also the superintendent in the same school district. Do you, is that true? Yeah, absolutely. So I got hired in uh, October of one year and then took over like uh, t- 14 months later in the, in the uh, you know, two Januaries later. And so have, I had 14 months of working side by side with the person in the role. And, um, you know, it was it was a, a, a really unique gift. Like I a, right. and, and it, it, it's a little bit, I think, as successful as the person you're working with. And I was working with a really, uh, you know, a wonderful leader who was completely different than me but was had no ego in it and was really helpful about transitioning and, and was helping, you know, and, and sort of gave things away to me as I picked them up. And it felt very natural. I, I often in, in the superintendency, it's, it's very, it's very sharp that, you know, it's like, it's like the hiring and firing of a hockey coach, right? Like, right. and there's a whole new person in with a new, a new way. And, and this was the exact opposite. And I think for the system, it was the right thing. So how, how, like, how did that even, like, was that normal in West Vancouver? Was it just a unique one-off circumstance? Like how, how was that even a thing at that time? Like that's what I'm really curious about. Yeah, it was a bit of a, it was a, it was a unique circumstance. Uh, You know, I'd like to think there was a few superintendencies available. You know, he kind of had a window of time left. 
Um, I, the, 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 the board was, I think hopeful I would stay. And so, you know, he, he had, he was, he was willing to, um, you know, to sort of signal that he'd, he'd leave in 14 months. If I'd be willing to say that I'd be willing to commit to this job and not be the superintendent for a while yet. And so it was, it was just the right set of circumstances, but like, but something we should be doing more often, like in these kind of jobs, it only makes sense. So you are basically the Conan O'Brien of superintendents and then they had the Jay Leno, but the Jay Leno actually left. Like it was kind of like that thing. <laughs> right. They didn't, they didn't give him, they didn't give him a better gig in prime time though, either. And right. then, you know, right. they didn't go make him the high school principal and then go, actually, we'd rather have him back as the superintendent. <laughs> right. Well, I, so the, 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 one of the reasons I asked you that the reason I asked you that is because I know a lot of people that are in administration, education, leadership, um, that's not a, a normal circumstance, but why not? And I think one of the things that really set me up to be effective in the principalship was I had a principal when I was a vice principal who basically said to me, like, I'm going to develop you into a principalship through this vice principalship. Like it was like, he would talk to me about why certain circumstances, right? Like, it, they, he was mentoring me through that process and it just set me up that I felt on my very first day I was flying because he would like walk me through stuff. I, I wouldn't have understood if he didn't do that. Right. Cause I think sometimes I watch the opposite, right? I think like you're the vice principal. These are your roles. I'm the principal. These are my roles and they're separate, but he, like we had those separated roles, but he did mentor me to prepare me to be successful in a principalship. And it, it made it to be honest, you made the difference. And I, and I've watched the opposite happen. And then, and then we're like, why are people struggling in this role? I'm like, well, because it's totally new and they didn't have that. You know, it's like, you think of a teacher who never had an internship ever. That would be terrifying. Right. So it's kind of neat to see that. Right. And like, I'm sure like you see that, you know, even at the mid level in your own school district. Well, you know, it's influenced my thinking, you know, in terms of how I appoint administrators, I will often look, if I know I want someone to be principal at school two years from now, I might try to move them into a VP role now. And knowing that that principal is going to retire in two years and they can transition. like, And also I'm keeping administrators longer in schools than I probably used to. I think both of those things are partly based on my own personal experiences and the success I had with my transition into the superintendency. Okay. Tell me, tell me about that. Tell me why, tell me why you keep principals longer now. Like what, what's, what's, what's changing that thinking? Yeah. So I have, I have principals even, I have one up to like up to 10 years in a high school now. So old thinking was, was, you know, it, it's like, like, like the hockey coach idea, every three to five years, move them on. They, they come in with a burst of energy in a new site. They get everybody excited. Yeah. But what I know is happening on the back end is lots of the staff are going, we've seen this game. We've seen this right. before three years from now, we're going to get somebody new, different flavor, different level of excitement. I'll wait it out. But, you know, now and and for principals to know, hey, if you say you're going to do something, I'm going to leave you there long enough that you actually have to do it. Right. And so um, I, I, we're fi- like I'm finding that we are having maybe it's does it's not as flashy, but it's more it's more sustainable. The changes that we're making because administrators are more consistent in their positions. OK, so I, so this is actually something that I'm really kind of adamant about. Uh, one of the things I struggle with that I watch in education is I, like, obviously, you, you know, we've talked a lot about my work in innovation and, you know, I talked about that and I, it's weird because I'm actually very anti latest and greatest. Let's do the new thing. Cause I'm like, we never got good at the old thing, right? Like give right. me some time. And so when I actually look, so like when I'm actually looking at the process of how you're doing it, I act weirdly enough having somewhere that are longer, I actually feel that's when you can do the more innovative things because you have to set up some like basic things that in your school. And really when I'm looking at innovation, it's about depth. It's actually not about the new, like it's not about attaching to the new thing. Right. And like, have you found like through this process having, you know, there's those relationships kind of building long-term that it actually has maybe helped you to, you know, really do some things that maybe kind of put, cause I know that you, you, you've done some like interesting things in your school district and a lot of people like kind of look to it, but having that consistency, does it actually lend to innovation in any way? Yeah. It, 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 I think you're exactly right. It's, it's so funny that way. 
I think, you know, right from, you know, me being in the job for more than a decade, you would think that we would, you know, that you could actually still have an innovative, you know, an innovative mm -hmm. mindset as you might like to have. Mm -hmm. Do I get it? Do I get a, a horn for that? Uh, sorry, uh, that's all I got. That's if I was ready, so but I'll give you that. I got it. All right, so here. you know that you actually have that. Um, you you know, right from me being in the role, yeah. that the the whole the whole piece around innovation, right? You know, through principles, I have. I think you're absolutely right because also then I have time that if we make a mistake. You have time to fix your own mistakes right. and go to and and then live with them and then and then create something new. You're not just like fixing the last you know man or woman's mistakes who are in the role and then and then being gone and then the next person going in and going oh I just inherited a mess and I got to clean it up. Everybody <laughs> always says they got to clean up for no the last. Never said that. That's never been said. Everybody, right? And so right, right. you know, in our in our schools, I'm trying to let you have let you have your own mess so you can clean up. Right. And that, and that, I think that, that to me is so important because I think there is that disconnect and, and I, I think for, to be, and it's interesting because I, I think like you, I've evolved in that thinking, right? I, right. I don't know how to said the same thing 10 years ago, right? You know, like it is good to like have, you know, new ideas and stuff like that too. But I think part of the reason why, um, a lot of those places that have consistency in the leadership, uh, are innovative because you have relationships, you know, you know, people got your back if something does go wrong and that they can kind of help guide through it. But if, you know, if you're new to the role, I don't really know you, I, I kind of just want to toe the line, do it. You kind of ask me. And then, like you said, wait it out to the next person. I'm going to do what they're doing. I don't think it gives anyone, you know, kind of that, that consistency. So I, I, I actually love that. Right. And it's, I, I, it's funny because I think kind of, as you said, I don't think we've been having this conversation this way 10 years ago. No, I for sure not. I agree. Right. right? And I think that, that to me, you know, I, I hope, you know, I hope I, you know, and maybe uh, who we'll see what happens in 10 years. If we actually still believe in that, that way too. Hey, can you actually tell us a little bit? What, what did you, what did you do in your dissertation? Like what was that focused on? Yeah. So I, I, my dissertation was around how superintendents spend their time, which seems like a bizarre topic. I you know for most people, <laughs> right, like right. what do they do? And so I actually went and found out what every superintendent does in BC. So there's 60 of them. Everybody participated. How they like how much time they spend with a board, how much time they spend in classrooms. You know, um, you know, is there a difference between experienced and newer superintendents? What about between male and female superintendents? Mm -hmm. It's a funny job because even as a principal, you have other principals you can look at around you. And teachers as a classroom, I always at least could compare myself to the people in other classrooms. But as a superintendent, like you have no comparables, like, like, am I doing this job like the right way or anything right. like what other people are? And right. I've been in the job for 10 years and I had no idea how my colleagues actually, what they did every day. Like it's like, I kind of guessed, but like, it was super right. interesting to find out. I, I just, I got really deep into the work around it. So like one of the things that I, like, I actually, uh, I saw some pictures of you, I think it was just yesterday you were going around to schools. Yeah, yeah. Uh, connecting. Uh, I saw that you took a picture with your, some of your leadership team. Like, I creep your, I creep your Instagram, man. Got to keep up, right? I know you. I know you check it out my Instagram for health and wellness tips, right? <laughs> so, so like, how how much? Like, I I think one of the questions I really want to kind of dive into is like, how much time do like like what is beneficial for a superintendent to be in a classroom, and what's that line where, like, how do you, how do you shape that line where it's not like a freak out when the superintendent comes in. Right. Mm -hmm. And also that it's not just tokenism that you're kind of just walking through, like, oh, the superintendent walked through so they could say he walked through, Super, right? The superintendent entourage. That's why I always joke about it. You got, you go on your knees, you got, you know, four board members with you. It's it's like, and people right. fake for, people fake for 50 minutes, right? Because I think that, I think, I think sometimes the, the uniqueness of some superintendent visits also causes the stress of when the superintendent comes. Right. You know, and, and, and COVID's been a little more challenging because I probably right. haven't been out as much. Right. Um, I think what what I enjoyed the most over the last few years is like when I went for like whole classes where I would put out and I, I haven't this year, be, uh, but I have in the last few years. Hey, I'm happy to come for a class and I'm even happy to talk to you about it before or after if you want me to do something inside that class. Really? And like where I actually got to see like the from beginning to end. And because because like you, I spent a lot of time talking about what classes are like. And what they should be like, but I better have, I better be, I better be rooted in how they, what they really are. Like, like I, right. I, I don't want to.
because now I've been in this role for a while, I don't want to just get, I don't want to just rely kind of on the, on the, the myths and the histories of this is what school is like, but this is what it should be like. I actually want to be there and see what it is like. And like teaching's hard. And so I actually want to be in there and seeing it be hard. Oh, you, I, I'm, I'm doing this for everyone listening. It, I know a lot of people love that answer. Cause they're like, I guarantee you someone's going, I wish my superintendent would do that. <laughs> I guarantee I you that just happened. Yeah. I, so you know what I found out in the, in the studies was I'm, what I'm blessed with is I have a board who really buys into yeah. governance here. And I, I like some superintendents spend 30 or 40 hours a week with trustees and I don't. Really? And, and so I'm really fortunate that way that, you know, I, I probably spend maybe 20% of my time on governance, which gives me a lot of time to spend on teaching and learning and the other parts of my role. So I, and I want to clarify this. The typical structure of a school district is the the board employs the superintendent, the superintendent employs everyone else. Correct. Is yeah. that, that's yeah. like, you know, so, and I, and I know this cause I've like, I've actually seen you connect with your board, um, you know, multiple occasions. I know I've connected with, uh, people. You, uh, we, 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 uh, we carpooled with now board chair Brody once in Toronto. That's right. And, and Dean Tresky. And yes. I remember Dean and I were fighting. And so, which is normal. So when you, when you have that pro like when you have that trust too, cause I think sometimes, uh, the reason that the board is all over the superintendents, they don't necessarily trust the person that they put in charge of the schools. Right. And I think sure. part of it, you have that trust and it's probably, you know, spending some time there, a considerable amount of time, uh, has helped you. Here's something, here's something I want to ask you about. And like, I never talk, I actually never talk about this because it's pretty rare. You still blog and I still blog. And we're like the last, like, are we the last two bloggers <laughs> We're in Canada? I don't know. It's like blogging is not like as big as it once was. And I've actually, I've actually, um, I, I read, um, I, I remember reading one of your posts talking about kind of that process and like, you still stick with it. Um, I, 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 I I'll be honest with you. I do it for me more than anyone. I yeah. think it really helps me kind of sort through ideas. And one of my favorite quotes is, uh, I think it's Clive Thompson. He says, anyone can win an argument inside their head, but when you have to face an audience, you have to be truly convincing. And so it makes me really think about what I say because I know it, like it, there's, there's a difference between me writing on my notepad. No one's going to ever see it versus me actually sitting down, writing a blog, pressing publish, knowing. So I got to really kind of think about what's going to be the pushback. What's going to be the challenge. So like as a super, and you've, you've been doing this, I think a little bit, cause I actually think I remember you, right before you were superintendent blogging and uh actually connecting in that space so like do you see the benefit of it still like what what's some of the positives about it still what's what's some of the things that you 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 maybe miss that we don't do as much like like how do you look at just blogging you know yeah i I, I still love it i love it for the right i love that i have a filing cabinet of my ideas like right. over time and like i I, I can, you know, when I, when, when the topic comes up in conversation, I can think about, oh yeah, I wrote about, and I, mm -hmm. I love to go back and read what I wrote about, you know, whatever it is. I got four or 500 posts in there now, probably in my archives. Mm -hmm. Like I've written, I've, I've thought about all these topics and now sometimes I think about them differently. Like we've already talked today, right. like our, our thinking evolves. And so I love that part. You know, it's, it is too bad that it's not as in, um, engaging with other people as it once was like right. comments. It, the blogs used to be like, oh my gosh, so and so has a new blog post, and like people were like, like you, you'd be all over it, right? And there was probably yeah. I had I, there was probably twenty bloggers who almost every week I was reading their stuff, and yeah. and so I miss I do miss that a little bit. Um, uh, I, it, I I I guess I was wrong. I thought everybody would have a blog, yeah. like I really thought that was the future that everybody would have their own digital space where they would write you know kids and teachers and and everybody and and that, that isn't where the world's gone we you know everybody has an instagram account everybody doesn't have a blog yeah like i i i maybe i'm just kind of old school i i still would love to see every kid out of that space and i'm not saying and i think for me because you know this too it's not necessarily i want every kid to write in a blog but to have that space so maybe some kids you know, share it through just podcasts, right? Right. Uh, they share it through video or, you know, they switch it up and they kind of do that too. And I think that like, that would actually, 
Because I like one of the things that you said, I think is really important is that it allows a kid to kind of go back and revisit their own learning and development through that process. And I think a lot of times when we're, we're doing this stuff with digital tools, but we're not sharing it in a space, it's just kind of like we're, we're just putting papers all over. And I, this is probably going to rest. Do you, you remember this when like in school districts, uh, basically at the end of the year, you would have like this, we'd have like a hard drive in the school and then your IT department say like, Hey, you got to clear the hard drive. Cause like, we don't have any space and like, you know, basically start a new, right. does that happen? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, right? for sure. And then you just basically like, it's like, basically it was like, just burn all our stuff. It was like the same thing we used to do in Saskatchewan when I grew up, we burn all our, because we're like, we'll never use that again. But like for me, sometimes uh, what I do is just like you said, I will literally Google my own name and put it like in two keywords to find old thinking of mine. So I can like revisit it, share in a post. And I remember actually, I, I can't remember if you were there, but it was in, it was in, um, I think it was Niagara Falls. I was sitting in a, a leadership session and it felt very like old school. And I, and I, and I, I shouldn't say old school. If it, it felt like the education going back in the wrong way. Cause I actually, I'm not against old school practice. I'm not against traditional practice. I'm against bad practice. Right. And I felt it was like going in a bad way. And I actually remember like literally popping up my laptop and just like writing the scathing post. Like if you don't change your thinking, you're like going to become irrelevant and like, we don't need you and blah, blah, blah. And it was like super harsh. Right. And I actually took that post probably six or seven years later. And I like went through it and wrote about it and how that was such a stupid approach of me. And I actually like still keep that because, because it was like, who, who did, who did I get on my side? I got on my side, the people who already agreed with me. And I just probably ostracized the people that I wanted to connect with most. And I, and like, I actually, I like that. I like, instead of deleting that and like, I, like I am embarrassed about it, but I actually do like, I like the thought that I could go back and say like, here's where I was off. Like, here's kind of, you know, where I had an issue with that. Right. Uh, you know, the one other piece is I don't think we have a lot of venues where we have like good conversations around education. Yeah. And so I, I think the blogs still, they still serve a purpose to that. Like, um, you know, in the traditional media, there's such little coverage around education, like around like, yeah, like they talk about whether we wear masks in schools, but they don't talk about about what what assessment should look like or what good practice is. And so, like, if the mainstream sort of communications aren't at least my blog is a way for to hopefully start a conversation because I know teachers read it in their schools, our parents read it still. Like, yeah, like my my readership I think peaked in 2012 or 2013. Right. Right. But like, it, it's it's still it still resonates and starts some conversations for me. So let's uh. But there's one blog post that you write every year. Oh, are we going to do this? My most yeah. popular post. <laughs> you're, you're, look forward to it every year, right? Well, tell us about the very special blog post you put out each year. Well, I'm, I, I guess I'm a little embarrassed to say that my most popular post, I think every year for the last decade, every year, every, every year. year is the post I write on April 1st. And so I can, I, I, I'm not sure if I can remember all of them, but the first year I wrote this post, where I said I was announcing my vlog, it was going to be a fax blog, and it would I was and you could sign up, <laughs> and you would send me your phone number, and I would fax you my blog so right. that you didn't have to have a computer, and that this was the next thing. It was going to be a fax a vlog, right. and you know I was I, and so and I had people biting, I had people right. biting on the vlog <laughs> that first year, and so uh, you know I got. Everybody like you got lots of traction the first year, and so ever since then, every April first, I and you go, you actually, you actually go back and talk about the initiative, the, the April Fools' initiatives every year too, right? Like yeah, I, have, I go through all the different things that we've done. Right? We uh, the most popular uh, April Fools' post I ever did was announcing a a school slash water park, and where which was kind of like you know how Great Wolf Lodge is like a hotel and right. a water park. Right. This was going to be a school and a water park combined together. Aqua literacy was the real <laughs> focus. And like, I get people were like, I oh, my it. God, this I is the it. greatest school I've ever heard of. I had. And so, uh, yeah, it's it, it's a little bit of pressure now because right. as soon as April 2nd hits, I'm going, OK, what am I writing about next year? Right. What, are we, what are we doing? So, 
can I ask you, like, other than me, who reads that still? Am I, uh, I'm always, I'm always up for the April first post. I even, I even started pre-texting you before it. <laughs> well, here, here's why. Actually, you know, I brought it up because it is kind of like it's hilarious, right? Which is kind of the point for me that it again really kind of humanizes you, right? Because it's, I think, a lot of times we kind of have this. There's this perception of superintendents. And, you know, they're disconnected or, you know, just kind of like a political figure and things like that. And then you do that stuff. And I think that kind of endear, and maybe like, I don't know if it endears you to community. Uh, but to me, that's something I, I, I like as a, like, I'm thinking about this as a parent. I, I love to see that. Right. I right. Think it's uh, cool. Like we got Like, I, I think it's super important that we try to humanize the role. Right. Like right. we do serious work, but like, we can't be taking ourselves no. too seriously all the time. Right. Like, no. and 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 some people, I, I I have had a few people offended that I would dare write April Fool's post. That's, you know, but like, right, whatever. Right. Well, you know, you're superintendent, so someone's going to be offended by something anyway. Right. right? That's, no right. matter they, what. They, they, I, I, I always think there are people just waiting to be offended by everything I write in, right. when I blog. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I Like I, I, I actually, maybe I should start commenting instead of just to do it in my text comments. Because I, <laughs> I actually get your blog to my email list. Like oh, I guess that's very kind, often, right? So, and I, I actually every time, Chris, every time you write your blog, uh, I always read it every single time, right? So I'm, I'm still kind of, I, I like that stuff. So you and my mom, you and my mom, I right, love it. Right. Hey, I got it. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna ask you a question, and I swear this was you, but if it isn't, then you got to pretend it was you, okay, and make this up. I swear that in an interview, you tweeted a question out and asked for help. Am I right on this? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's true. So this goes back. So this goes back to my when I when I was in the interview to become superintendent. Yeah. What they what they did was um, this is now what year 2009. Right. So 2000 uh, October. Yeah, October like of 2009. I guess this is, and and you had an hour to. They give you a question, and then you had an hour, and then you had to present to the board and fi- with 15 minutes sort of a succinct, you know, it was kind of, it was one of those, like, what does the next 10 years look like in education in our community? Kind like of an questions. hour before your interview? Is that so an hour before your interview, they give you the question so that you can prepare. If you want to make some slides, or you want to write right. notes, and then you come in and make a presentation to the trustees. Yeah. And so as soon as I got the question, I posted it on Twitter. Yeah. Which was at the time was like, what are you doing? Like, you're right. why, why nice. are you cheating? Why are you cheating on the question? Right. And, and and I and then I rather than rather than present on the topic precisely, what I went into the interview and said was, I go, you should you should care less about what I think. But I want to tell you about how I'm going to go and get the best information. And one of the ways I'm going to do that is I'm going to leverage my network. And over the last hour, I put this your question out to the smartest people I know. And right. here's some of the things they've told me what, what we should be talking about. And so, you know, that notion that when you hire, you know, it's in the old age, it, it, it was like, you know, it was the it was the network of people you went through university with or at the country club. In our in our for you and me, the, our network has been our digital networks. And right. so when you bring us in, you're bringing your, our digital networks with you. Yeah, because like it's like that old adage. It's not like not it's not who you it's not what you know, it's who you know. Yeah, but it's kind of like. It's not what you know, it's who you're connected to. Like, like you know, kind of shifting that. I, I, like, I I actually feel good because I was like, okay, I was right. I remember because I, I distinctly remember you telling that somewhere and thought that was like really fascinating. Um, some, some places, and I, I think this is kind of a, a tribute to uh, your school board, at least at the time, and, I, and I'm sure still to this day, uh, you know, appreciated that you actually did that. Because there's there's been this other this other fast, and I I don't know if you've ever seen this, uh, where teachers have said to me, look, if I tweet out a question to my like to like Twitter that hey, can I get some help with something? My principal or my administrators think that I I'm not actually ready to do the job, right? And and actually am like incompetent because I had to ask the question, right? Is um, it a sign of weakness or strength, right? When you ask it, right? Right. And, and to me, yeah. And I think that that's exactly the way I look at it is that I, I would rather you go ask for help and, and do something than not know and do something. Do you know what I mean? Like that to me is like that, that's what we want. And then it, like, cause I've seen the exact opposite. 
of that kind of being discouraged. And I'm like, I, I want people with the best ideas. And I used to say this to my staff, I don't care if it's your idea or my idea, I just want the best idea. And wherever that comes from, that's that's what we want to kind of tackle into, right? So that that is like, that is that is really cool. Um, do, do you see those space, like those spaces have changed, right? Where like, if you ask that today on Twitter, do you think you'd still get the same response? Uh, I, I, I got like, I can't remember. It was old, like, I got at least a dozen or 15 yeah. co- like people, thoughtful comments. I wouldn't get any of that anymore. Twitter's right. Twitter's not the space to get that now. Like, yeah. I don't know. You know, it's one of our challenges. I think we don't have, we don't have those as, as we don't have public thoughtful spaces like we did then. Yeah. I, like, I, I think, um, uh, this is this is I actually I'm curious what you think of this. So I, I, I don't know if we don't have public spaces. Um I th- I think that some of them are smaller. So like this is kind of I don't know if you can see that I have like a box of like Jordans. I got like all my basketball shoes and stuff. Like I'm like big into basketball shoes. And uh I I connected with this group. Uh it's called Soul Savvy. And basically it's all these people who are interested in like basketball shoes, but the it's like weird because they they the whole premise of the group is to get basketball shoes at retail price because like a hot Mike Jordan one could actually sell for like $1,500 on the secondary market. And what's interesting is that it's like a smaller community. It's focused on this. And like, you have these people all kind of connect in the space. So if you're like, Hey, I need, like, I actually say, can someone help me get this shoe? Cause I'll be working at the time it drops. And so like people from like across the world, or like, sorry, across Canada, because it's a Canadian, like it's through Slack. Yeah. We'll actually like buy the shoe for you. And and then you just, they'll like ship it to you and you pay them back. And like, even if like, let's say you got it from three people, I would like still pay for that shoe because the worst thing that would happen is would someone say like, George asked me for this help and then he didn't come through. And then I'd be like, you know, look bad in the group. And so like, I feel like there's like these other spaces and like, I know I'm giving a, an example with a basketball, you know, basketball shoe, which, you know, 99% of people listening to this do not care about, but I think there's those spaces that we can find that have like smaller groups to connect with, because I, I think there's kind of this point where something gets maybe too big and it's like, I, I felt it was like a lot more intimate space at that time, but now it's, it feels like a lot more is like, it's just so there's so many educators in that space that it's harder to get, you know, answers maybe in a way it used to be. Yeah, I, I think you're. I think you're right. I think, and I think for a while, um, in the earlier days of social media, we were looking to gather large, can, large groups, and right. now we're looking to gather like astronomically new, large. Right. Like we're right. trying to like that was the goal was like right. how big a network can you have rather right. than like can I actually have people that I can really count on? Like it's no right. different than in the in in the in the you know the face to face world, right? Like right. it's you know the people that want to make a connection with uh, 200 people, but sometimes the people that are connected to three people are far more connected people. Totally. Yeah. It's weird because, you know, like you and I connect on Twitter, but I would never tweet you anything. I would just text you. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of like, it's kind of like, I like Chris Weiger from like, you know, uh, BC. There's like a lot of people from uh, British Columbia that I, you know, I still connect with. And it's like, I got my network. And now those people that I really want to connect with, I connect with, on a personal level, right? Like, yeah, but George, would we would we find each other now on Twitter? I don't think so, eh? Uh, yeah, like I, yeah, like I, like I'll look if someone's mad at you and stuff like that. But other than that, right? <laughs> I, just you, I, I just, I just look to see uh, right. where you're on vacation or mm. if you lost more weight or right, where I'm working out and stuff like that. Yeah. Selfies, things like that. Gym selfies. See if I'm sweating today. Don't worry. Yeah. It's basically the same time every day. It's the same time every day I'm finishing my workout. So you know, while you're working and stuff like that. So. Hey, I, I got to ask you this. Um, do you, you coach your own kids, correct? Like yes. you have for you. How, how is that? How is that process? Uh, like, like, do I like it? Is it my good at it? Uh, well, no, not I, like, how is it when you coach your own kids and you got to give some like, you know, tough, like what, what happens when, like, how do you kind of go through the role of coach and dad? Right. Like, yeah. Like, um, I, 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 let me say that like, so my daughter's playing, uh, plays basketball at St. FX now she's at university and I coached her all the way through. And I, I'm, I'm just loving it right now being a fan. Like it's so yeah. nice. Like I, I, I feel I missed out a little bit being a fan yeah. of hers over, over her whole career because I was always her coach and I was always the team coach. And like, 
it's it, now it's so nice just to be a, a spectator and right. and be like I'm I'd be, be a, a knowledgeable dad. spectator and be a dad like and so I didn't really I don't think I fully appreciated how much I missed out on by not actually having the dad role because um you know there's there's only so many people that know stuff about basketball so if you know stuff right. they're gonna break they're gonna drag you into coaching right and so pretty much whenever my kids will play basketball I've been involved to some degree with her with the coaching hey, of it that hey so that comment you just made there's only so many people know much about basketball. I don't think that's going to be true anymore in like five, 10 years because of the Raptors. Right. Right. Well, there's definitely, there's a definite shift there. Like um, yeah. I, I think, I think we're the, one of our problems with growing youth basketball, now we're switching topics in this country has yeah. been that the, the generation of people our ages is a very small group who have knowledge, but right. the, the group coming through next, it will look more like hockey and soccer right. where, where people grew up with the game and then we'll give back to the game. Hey, I got to ask you this question. Where were you when Kawhi Leonard hit the shot that bounced four times? I was at uh, Swan Guard Stadium in Burnaby. My son was at a track meet, but they had it on the big screen at the end of the stadium. They had the game showing on the big screen when it happened. So do you know where I was? Where were you? At the game. Hey, oh boy. I, I actually didn't even care what your answer. I just wanted to brag. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to say I was at the game. You actually, just so you know, if you look at the highlight, I'm not even kidding. If you look at the highlight of that shot at the beginning, you can see the back. You can literally see me yeah, in the back part. Are you eating a hot dog? No, I was done with my hot dog. Hot dog at halftime. But I'm like, I'm like 10 feet away from Gasol passing it in. And I it was it was pretty cool. So uh, yeah, I can't where were we? I can't remember. I just want well, you to don't care. Doesn't I matter. Was I was there. It was a pretty, it's uh it's one of those like um it's like a Canadian, you know, those commercials, of Canadian heritage moments. Yes. It's going to be one of those. And it's going to be like, where were you when? I'm like, I was, I was that guy right there. See me. Were so, you videoing it or did you watch it? So, so I, this is, I got it on Instagram, actually the video. So I have the video of the entire play up to three bounces. Not no. even. So I like got so excited. I dropped my camera on the fourth bounce. To, so like, if you watch my video, you would never know if it went in. It was like a cliffhanger movie. So I couldn't hold it. I was just so, it, it was like, it was a, one of the most surreal. It was probably like one of the best games I've ever been to. Plus with one of the best endings, right? Like it was actually, right. it was a good game the whole time and actually being there and seeing that. And it was just, you know, it was, it gives me chills because one of the things I know we're, we're talking education, parenting, all that stuff too. One of the things that I was so excited about with the Raptors is that you and I grew up loving basketball, but it was not like a nor like it was not a thing in Canada. And I felt like there was this huge shift and it just made me, I was like, it was not just the Raptors winning. It was that basketball was seen differently in the country. Do you know what I mean? And that was like yeah. a huge, that was a good thing for me as a kid growing up who, who literally, I don't know if this happened to you. Cause we grew, I grew up in Saskatchewan. I used to get teased mercilessly because I play basketball. Right. It was like, why don't you play hockey? Right. And right. still like, People are like, I go to a city, they're like, oh, you want to go hockey? I'm like, no, not basketball. Like, we thought you are from Canada. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> we have basketball here too, right? So, uh, Chris, can I ask you this? What has been the best thing for your school district um, through this whole process of the last, like, I don't even want to say the last year and a half. It's like a blur, right? It feels like a blur. What's been like the best thing that's happened? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, so the thing I'm most excited about is around like, it was around high schools and secondary schools. Right. I am really, I, I think, I think we have, I think we have really challenged structures. Like, and I know structures aren't the be all and end all things, but we, you know, we believed kind of like every class had to be in person for 120 hours and you had to have a teacher in front right. of 30 kids and it had to happen every other day for 10 months. And that's how, that's how school happened in high school. And all of a sudden the pandemic said, well, no, like some things will be, half in person, half online. Some are right. going to be in a quarter system, in a semester system. Actually, we should give t kids some flexible time so they can make choices over where they spend their time. Like all of that, all of that thinking around time has right. really, I think that's like, I'm uh, there is like, there's stuff that we're holding on to that's never going to disappear. Yeah. And I, I, that to me is just awesome because like we were talking about earlier, that idea of like to innovate, disrupt your routine, the routine has been disrupted. And one of the things I talk about with groups is, are you just trying to like hold out to get back to 2019? Or are you saying like, Hey, there's things that we recognize during this process 
that actually can work really well and actually creating something new, right? Creating something better than what we had before through what we've learned through that process. So uh, I can't think of anyone better from my experience to, to lead that. I know West Vancouver schools, uh, I know is blessed to have you, even though probably some days as a superintendent, you wouldn't feel that, yeah. but, uh, I really appreciate you taking your time and, uh, I hope you have a great year and I can't wait for you to see, uh, my coaching picks of me and my daughters, you know, soon. And then you'll, you'll, you'll get to relive that, uh, part of your, you know, uh, uh, of your fatherhood there too, through me. Absolutely, George. It was a real pleasure doing this. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Chris, for your time.